Man, I tell you, I love these days at church. These child dedication days, aren't they awesome? I mean, come on, somebody help me today, aren't they? I mean, really, aren't they? they are, they're just incredible to, to see the stories. But you know what I really love is you never know what kids are going to do. Like, I'm telling you, we've done these now, Linda, for years, and you just never know when you put kids on stage you just never know what's going to happen. It's always like a mystery, and you're going, okay, anything could happen. Sometimes children just, they throw a fit. They cry. They scream. Sometimes they just run around. We've had kids up here, they just start running around. Mm -hmm. Just like they just do their own thing. We've had babies poop on stage. It's what they do. It's what kids do. But what we want to talk about today is what happens when adults do what kids do. What happens when adults never really seem to grow up and still act like infants? Good. Is that a great question, Linda? That's a great question. Because it happens all of the time. All the time How yeah. many of you know that you can grow older but not grow up? It's true. Good. One of the core values here at TE Church that we're going to talk about today is growing in our faith. Last Sunday, we talked about one of our values is we're called to serve each other. And can right. we celebrate? After the service last Sunday, we saw 100 new people mm -hmm. sign up to serve. So good. Isn't that great? In the midst of all three of the services, mm -hmm. another thing we do here, a core value, is we give our best. Another core value, share our story. And lastly, what we're talking about, we grow our faith. Yes. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians. He talks about people that were Christians, but they weren't growing spiritually. In other words, they were staying and thinking and acting like infants. Paul said this to the church at Corinth in a book in the Bible called Corinthians. He, I think he's frustrated when he's writing this, and he said this. He said, my friends, you are acting like people of the world. In the Bible, it talks about us being in the world, but not of the world. In other words, we live in this world. We don't have a choice. This is where we are. This is where we live. But we are supposed to be different than everyone else that's living in the world. We've been called out of this world. We are now part of a greater world, a kingdom, Linda, kingdom of God. And he said this, that's why I could not speak to you as spiritual people. Watch this. You are like, Wah. that sounds kind of like a sheep, actually. I, now that I've said, did it, he doesn't say sheep, he said babies. He said, wow, wow, wow. Is that better? Much better. Okay, wow, wow. Much yeah, better. you're like babies as far as your faith in Christ is concerned. So I had to treat you like babies and feed you milk. Mm -hmm. You could not take solid food, and you still cannot because you are not yet spiritual. You are jealous and argue with each other. Uh oh. This proves you are not spiritual and you are acting like the people of this world. God wants us to grow up and not act like babies. So what we thought we would do today, something a little different. In the first half of the message, we're going to give you some characteristics of spiritually immature people. People that are still kind of acting like infants or babies in the faith. And then we're going to flip the script, the last part of the message. Yeah. We're going to give you some characteristics of people that are spiritually mature. People that are growing in their faith mm -hmm. and some of the characteristics those people would have. So yes. let's start with spiritual mm -hmm. kind of immaturity on the front end. Let's Linda. start there. Do you feel like we're in a spotlight right now? Like there's a big spotlight. Oh, there's a glow. Is there's there a always glow? a glow Is there like a big you. spotlight on us? Yeah. See what okay. I did there? All right. Honey, there's always okay. glow around you. All right. So the first one is this. Oh, I missed that. Wait, what did you say? I'm yeah. sorry. I wasn't paying attention. I really wasn't. What did you say? It was good. Something nice? Okay. It was, it was good. <laughs> Thank it was you. Something awesome. Thank man. you. Yeah. Spiritually immature people are easily offended. We're just going to dive right in it. Easily offended. So in today's culture, I think it's really easy for us to get offended. Yes. You know, it used to be we didn't have social media, now we do, and people say things and put things on there, and we get offended by the things that they say, and sometimes we get resentful, sometimes we hold a grudge. Mm -hmm. We actually hold it for a long time. When anybody says something that we don't like, we take a stance, and we look at that post and say, I can't believe they posted that, I can't believe they're saying that. When we get offended, it does something inside of us. You know, if something doesn't go our way, we get offended. We just, again, we see something that we don't like and we just say, no, that, I, I'm just not going to accept what they say. 
And sometimes when we're offended, we end up talking to people and they kind of know that we're offended, but we're not going to act like we're offended. Yeah. So we got the offensive side. So someone comes up and we're just not going to talk to them in the same way. And they can feel from body, our body stance, or maybe we walk away, or if they say something like, are you okay? And you say, I'm fine. Everything's okay. I'm fine. When really we're carrying this offense inside of us yes. and we stay offended because we don't want to accept the thing that someone else says. But I want us to understand something today as we kind of move forward, actually in this whole message, but in particular right now, that God knew that you were going to deal with offense. And because he loves you, because he cares for you, and because he wants to help you, he gave us some scriptures to be able to follow. And the first one I want to lay out for you today is this, in Colossians 3.13. Make allowance for each other's faults. You see, everybody has faults. Make allowances for their faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So when you don't forgive, when you stay offended, this is a sign that maybe you're not as spiritually mature as God would want you to be. Can I just say it like that? Because we're all growing in our faith. We all come in at different places, and we're all in this room at different places in our faith. But as Jesus' followers, he expects us to grow into mat uh, spiritual maturity. Or we're going to walk around hurt and angry, and bitter, and upset for the rest of our lives. He doesn't want us to live in that place. So being offended is a choice. Like no one can make you be offended. You choose to be offended, right? I see some people nodding their heads up and down. We know that. We choose to be offended. But I want you to remember this as I close down this little point, that offense is an event, but being offended is a decision. Wow, it's a decision you make. Amen. Yeah, it's great. Linda, we've seen people walk out, walk away from God's calling mm -hmm. on their life because they got offended. Right. And they just walk away from God's plan, purpose, and provision mm -hmm. for their life. So spiritually mature people, babies, Paul, that's what Paul said. He did. Get offended easily. Mm -hmm. Here's the second thing. Spiritually immature people justify their sin. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the room right now and those watching online, we all have one thing in common. Everybody in the room, ready? We're all jacked up. Mm -hmm. Every single person here, listen to what I'm telling you. You're jacked up. Mm -hmm. I'll say it to the middle section. You're jacked up. I'll come over here in case you feel left out of the party today. You're jacked up. No, I don't mean that negative. I'm, I'm just trying to... Speak the truth. What do I mean by jacked up? I mean, we're all dealing with something. We right. all have issues. Everyone in the room. Here's what some people have figured out. You hide it better than others. Mm, truth. That's you figured true. out how to mask your stuff so that it looks like you're not really dealing with anything, but everyone is dealing with something. Mm -hmm. And what we do, Linda, is, is we kind of process it and we do learn to justify it. Right. And at TE Church, when you first walk in on the back wall, it says the perfect place for imperfect people. We don't expect perfection, but we do want to see progress mm -hmm. in each of your lives. Mm -hmm. Amen. We want to see Good. you moving forward. We say this is a place where it's okay not to be okay as long as you're on your way to getting okay. Mm -hmm. And the one way, watch this, that you can start to get okay is when you call out what's not okay in your life. Mm -hmm. When you, listen to what I'm telling you, when you can look at your life objectively and say, this is not good, mm -hmm. this is not acceptable. And I would say most people in the room, here's the tension, the, the challenge. It's not that you don't want to live the new life that Christ gave you. Mm -hmm. It's that you're just still hanging on to the old life because mm -hmm. you still feel like it's better than the new life. So good. That's the truth. That's good. We, we, we want the new life, but we can't let go of the old life because we're not convinced if we fully sacrifice and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, what he can give us is better than what the world can give us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we justify what we do mm -hmm. in the world. Let, let me give you an example. You're married but you Snapchat that person because they can give you something that your spouse isn't giving you. I mean, I, there's really nothing going on, but they don't understand me. My husband doesn't understand what I'm dealing with. My, my wife doesn't really understand. And they're just comforting me, and we justify it. Hmm. You fly off the handle. You, you kind of have these moments. You say, well, that's just the way that I've always been. Justify 
you're an adult and you're still smoking weed and you go, well, listen, it helps me. It, it's, it, it works for me and it, it should be okay because I've done the research and, and Google said that it, it can actually help me because, man, you can trust Google, can't you? And it's, and it's natural. There can't be anything wrong with it. I mean, God made weed. Yeah, God made tobacco and that will kill you. So ju- I'm just saying we justify things that we want to do. We, we justify our, our abuse. Well, it's been passed down through my family line. We, we justify all of these things that we do, and it's just a, it's a repetitive cycle that, that we get into. It's just who I am. And I remember with me, and this is going to be my hope for you today, there was a point when I started getting serious about walking with Jesus, not just attending church, but I wanted to be more like Jesus. I wanted to be a disciple. And I prayed a dangerous prayer that I'm going to consider, have you consider praying today. And here's the prayer. It's really simple. God, show me right now anything that's not okay for me. Hmm. Just reveal that. God, what am I doing that's not okay? And what am I not doing that I should be doing. And I promise you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, even right now in this room, if I paused for 10 seconds and you prayed that and you said that, I promise you, you would hear from God. And God would reveal those things to you just like that. Then it comes down to, what am I going to do with what I heard? And my life started going in a different direction when I prayed that dangerous prayer and asked God to show me. And then I had to do what he said. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul said this, powerful, powerful text. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who submit to or perform homosexual acts, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Mm -hmm. Underline the word were. Mm -hmm. Because of what Jesus did, it doesn't have to be who you are. Mm -hmm. That's who you were. (laughs) Jesus has paid the price and given you the power to step out Mm -hmm. of the were and into who you are. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Watch this. So now I don't have to justify sin because I've been justified by him. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, here it is. Ready? Everything is permissible for me. I can do whatever. God's paid the price. I can do whatever I want. That's freedom. That's grace. But not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. At some point, you've got to grow up and understand Jesus is the master. I am going to run to him. I'm not going to run to her. I'm not going to run to that thing, that drug, that drink, yeah. that situation, that person. That is no longer Good. my master. Right. Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. He is the master. Be careful not to let anything else master you. Here's here's the process. What you're going to do, watch this. You're going to call it out. You're going to pray it out. Then you're going to work it out. Mm -hmm. One more time, you're going to identify it. Lord, this is what you're speaking to me. I need this Mm -hmm. to stop. You're going to call it out. You're going to pray it out. You're going to work it out. That's good. Amen? Amen. All right. Okay, this next one, I want to preface it because I'm a firm believer that we are all, we can all be independent thinkers, we can all be strong in our faith, and we can all um, go a lot farther than we think we can. In fact, I would say like this, you're stronger than you think you are. So the point is this, spiritual immature people need coddled. It's a tough one for me to talk about in this way because I don't want you to feel that if you're in a space where you're being coddled now that you're going to be there forever. Like I want you to believe that you can move past it. So we have an amazing grandson, Judah, who was um, actually dedicated at the first service, and he's a little bit over two months old now, so that's pretty exciting, but he has this routine. He does this. He eats, he sleeps, he poops, he pees, he naps, and when he is not satisfied and doesn't have any of those things, you know the thing he does next? He cries. And what does he do when he cries? What do we do when he cries? We pick him up and we hold him and we coddle him, and we feed him, and we change him, and we do all the things that we're supposed to do with a little baby. 
What we have to be careful of as we become spiritually mature, that we don't need coddled every step of the way. That there will be a time and a place where we will say, I don't need someone to hold my hand the whole time. I'm able to be fed, I'm able to feed myself. I don't have to rely on someone else to feed me the whole time, especially in the church. We have to think about the church because as you grow, the church is not the place that has to feed you. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you're depending on the church to feed you all of the time, then you, there are going to be times where you're going to be hungry. In fact, there will be times where you will starve. Because the church has not, God did not develop the church just to feed you, but really to empower you. God has sent us to be able to empower, you can clap for that, because that's God, that's like good saying that. Too. Wow. How crazy would it be if all of us had to be fed all the time, like we all had to be held, all of our hands had to, be, had to be held? What God wants us to do is to empower you to be able to go out into the world, invite more people in, and then they, in their immature state of believers, they begin to grow up and the cycle continues. See, our job is the great commission to go out into the world and to reach more people for Jesus. How do you do that if you're still having to be fed all of the time? Let me read this, oh, let me, let me just add this to it. Another form of coddling is this, when you have to be chased after all the time. So you have to be texted and called, hey, are you coming to church? Are you gonna be at church today? Are, are, are you coming next week? As a believer that's becoming spiritually mature, somebody calling you and texting you 24 seven is not really where God wants you to be. Ask yourself this question, does your employer text you every Monday to come to work? Does your, the gym owner of the gym, does he or she call you every week to make sure you're going to go work out? Does your coach have to text you every time there's a game? I mean, let's think about it. Why would we have to be texted and called every time we have to come to the church? So becoming spiritually mature means that we don't have to be coddled in the way that we did in the beginning. There were times yeah. where you may needed to be called because you just weren't getting it yet and you weren't that place. But at a certain point as you're becoming spiritually mature, you don't have to call me. I'm gonna be there every Sunday on my own. I'm taking my kids every Sunday Amen. on my own. I'm gonna hear the word and then I'm gonna go out into the world and I'm gonna help more people. So I'm gonna challenge you as you begin to think about becoming spiritually mature that you don't have to be coddled that someone doesn't have to hold your hand as you're going through life and going through your spiritual journey, but that you're ready to step into a life class, that you're ready to step into a grow group, that you're ready to come to church every week, that you're ready to raise your kids in the church as we saw today, yes. that your desire would be to grow to a place where now you are inviting others to come in and meet Jesus. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew. He said, who needs a doctor? The healthier the sick. Go figure out what this scripture means. I'm after mercy, not religion. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. Whoa, wow. Isn't that so good? Wow. Think of it this way, and then we're going to close this out. When you think of a baby, you're always thinking about, does the baby need fed? Does the baby need changed? Does the baby need to be picked up? Does the baby need this? We don't want to be a church of people who are constantly thinking, does that, does that person need this all the time? You want to be the person who is now helping others to become spiritual mature in their faith and begin to feed yourself as you walk on your spiritual journey. Amen? Amen. Amen. Those are, hey. I promise and you. And those are tough words. That's no tough words. No one need, needed reminded that 7.30 last night Ohio State was playing. Promise you. I promise right. you. The game, right. people were ready. Man, I want people to have the same excitement for the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's flip the script. Let, mm -hmm. Let's talk about what spiritually mature people, some of the traits they start to display. And the first is this, they practice personal responsibility. Which actually ties into the last one. It does. Mm -hmm. It's just we're responsible. Yeah. When, when we're young, part of growing up is really taking responsibility and, and taking care of business, if you know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. What, when you're young, people do everything for you. Right. Somebody has to tie your shoes. Somebody has to brush your teeth. Somebody has to lay out your clothes. They have to clean your room. Mm -hmm. They have to take care of all the details. Mm -hmm. Then, hopefully, as you grow older, you start taking on responsibility. Mm -hmm. Start taking care of those things yourself. You start maturing. Get a job. 
pay your bills, take care of the, the house, some things like that. And when you do these things, when, when you grow up and you take responsibility, there are rewards for being responsible. Now, on the other side, there are consequences for irresponsibility in our life. And it's a universal biblical principle called reaping and sowing. And what that means is if you sow good things or if you make good choices in your life and are responsible, generally speaking, there'll be a good outcome. But if you're irresponsible, you make bad choices, don't be surprised of what you reap is some bad situations. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's reaping and sowing. And what a lot of people do is they make bad decisions and then they blame God when their life doesn't look the way that they want it to. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying we've got to have personal responsibility to make better decisions. And this is part of growing up. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. How many of you know people that the way they were in high school is still the way they are today? Two things. You can call it what you want. Peter Pan syndrome, Uncle Rico syndrome. Four people got that. Google it. Uncle Rico. We got to grow up. At some point, we are called to grow up spiritually. And I could tell you so many stories of so many stupid things that I did. So I can talk about it because I lived it. Mm -hmm. I did so many, un I grew up in the 80s. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I did stupid, awesome, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Everybody else that grew up in the 80s is still a little foggy. They're like, oh, what's he saying? <laughs> but, I mean, I did stupid things. Mm -hmm. But there was a point, now watch this, when I, again, I tie it all back to when I got serious about Jesus. There was a point when I started following Jesus, I, thought, I said, man, I've got to put away some childish things. Mm -hmm. I've got to start making different decisions. And here's why. Something clicked with me when I read this verse in 2 Corinthians 5.20. It said, we are Christ's representatives, and through us, God is calling, let me change one word, them. And what I began to understand, it's one thing if my stupid decisions just affect me, but I better be careful when my stupid decisions start affecting other people looking at me wanting to see Jesus. And here's what I want to here's what I want to challenge you with. If you're not a believer here today, you're just checking it out, you can do whatever you want. But if you're authentically following Jesus. You post those Christian memes, oh, God is good, I'm trusting God, X, Y, Z, whatever you want to put. If you're authentically doing that and then behind the scenes doing jacked up things, I'm telling you, people are looking at you going, why would I want what you have? Because it's no different than what I have. It's absolutely no different. And here's the thing. Every, watch this. Every decision you make now as a believer is doing one of two things. It's either bringing people closer to the cross or they're looking at your life and it's moving them further away mm -hmm. from the cross. Yep. And my hope is as we grow, we take personal responsibility and even today, as the spirit of the living God speaks to us, we go, man, I want to check myself before not only I wreck myself, but I wreck my testimony mm -hmm. and keep other people from coming to mm -hmm. know the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So Amen. Amen. Second thing that spiritually mature people do is that spiritual mature people are quick to forgive. Quick to forgive. Because we always have to forgive. There's a quote that says this, unforgiveness is like you taking poison and waiting for someone else to die. Hmm. So I'm going to take poison, but I'm waiting for someone else to die. They might not even know that they need to be forgiven, yeah. but I'm holding on to something pretty deep. You know, in my experience with forgiveness, which I've had to forgive a lot, if I had allowed forgiveness, unforgiveness, that poison to take root inside of me, then I really believe that there would have been a disease that was growing. You know, because we said that we're becoming spiritually mature, we're growing. But unforgiveness produces something that's poisonous to our body, yeah. that actually is infectious to our body, body, and it develops things in our lives where in relationships we end up having lack of trust with people. We end up feeling like we're always being betrayed. We sometimes withdraw into places because we can't deal with situations anymore or we have re re um, relationship difficulties. So unforgiveness is so 
detrimental to the future of our lives. It keeps us what I would call tethered to something, connected to something in a way that you cannot let go of that, but if you cannot let go of it, you cannot move on from it. Yeah. So if you're still connected to something that's like a dead weight, you're trying to move, it's like moving in, in quicksand. You're trying to move, you're trying to move, but really you're not getting anywhere. You can really fe- never have that deep relationship with someone else because you're thinking of what happened to you before. And I know it firsthand, I've had to forgive a lot. I've had to forgive people for what they've said about me, for gossip, for slander, for hurts. I've had to forgive guys in my life who have really hurt me in a bad way, relationships from my past. Currently, we've had to forgive people just for things that happen while you're leading a church. It's not easy. But what I'm learning through the process is it's much better, as we said before, not to be offended and then also to just let go and forgive someone. Because we can't control what that other person says. But, but I'm going to ask you this question. Maybe you're at the place right now, you're like, yeah, I want to forgive. I've got something right now. It's that one thing, that one person, that one situation that happened to me. But I don't know how to do it. Because I don't think it's all the time that we don't want to forgive. I've had people come up to me as recently as two weeks ago and said, how do I forgive? Yeah. How do I let go? How do I stop being connected and tethered to that thing? Ephesians 4.32 says this. Be kind to each other, tender-hearted. There's something about tender-hearted. Forgiving one another just as God has forgiven you because you belong to Christ. Let me stop on tender-hearted. What happens when you are unforgiving, you end up getting a hard heart. I think there's a reason that Paul puts this in his scripture in Ephesians to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, because you can, be, you can have a hard heart and then not be able to forgive, right? Yes. But when you have a tender heart, there's an openness that you have that you would not have any other way. Amen? Like, I feel like I'm preaching to somebody right now. That there's something, someone that has that hard heart. Because people are going to hurt you. You're going to get hurt. But don't hurt yourself by holding on to unforgiveness. Don't hurt yourself. Listen, people may not deserve your forgiveness, but you deserve peace. Yes. You deserve peace. Right there. That's good. I want to give you three things to do. If you're in a state right now, and this is just a a step this big. I mean, we could do a whole course on this, a whole series on forgiveness, unforgiveness. But three things, as you become spiritually mature, and today's the day you're going to take another step if you're one of these people who's unable to forgive today. The first thing is this. I want you to remember the hurt. It's remember, recognize, and release. You can write that down. Remember, recognize, release. Remember the hurt and what was done to you. The first thing is to think about the thing that happened because you have to acknowledge that it happened before you can heal from what's happened. The second thing is this. I want you to recognize how the unforgiveness keeps you tied to that person. They don't even know that you haven't forgiven them yet. They're on with their lives. They're they're partying, they're doing their whole thing, and you're still going back to that place because you're still connected. Here's my suggestion. Get your big shears, your kitchen shears, or your things you cut hedges with, and take that and cut that rope and let that person go, and you start to move on. Yes. And then the third one is this, because we talked about unforgiveness being a poison. Then you can release the poison of unforgiveness. That's right. Read the scriptures. This is basic, guys. I know it takes more than this, but this will at least get you started. And I'll end with this, this statement. Forgiveness doesn't excuse their behavior. Forgiveness keeps their behavior from destroying you. There it is. Amen? Forgive. Brilliant. Forgive. Hashtag get the shears. Isn't that a great hashtag? That's the new forgiveness hashtag, get the shears. Here's the last thing. Spiritually mature people give their best and share their story. Mm, Give their best and share their story. Somebody asked me, well, what are the characteristics? How do I know if I'm spiritually mature? Let me tell you what spiritual maturity is not. People go, well, I've attended church for all my life. Doesn't matter. I know Bible verse and chapter. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can pray out loud. Doesn't matter. Spiritually mature people, number one, they give. Mm. And here's the difference. All of those things that I said first, you can learn to do. But giving takes faith. Mm, That's good. Giving is about your faithfulness. It is not about your finances. And it requires real faith in order to give your best. 
And I think it's a challenge for most of us. If we went around the room, one of the, the stumbling blocks for many people is giving God what actually belongs to God and bringing the tithe. I want to talk about how it changed my life briefly and what I did. And prayerfully, this will help somebody today. Because I was a guy that I did not tithe. After I came to faith in Christ, I was like, no, this is my money. I'm hanging on to this. I, I need this. I'm not going to make it without it. But as I began to grow, and again, ask and pray dangerous prayers, God revealed to me, God took me to this scripture in Psalm 24.1. He said, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. And what God said is, you thought it was all yours? It's all mine. I've just given you some of that on loan. And what the Lord gives, the Lord can take away. And as fast as I got it, I could lose it all that quickly. So I began to understand it is not mine. It is God's. Then I began to study the principle of blessing that comes through sowing. Those that sow generously, reap generously. I would say this, if you're not sowing, you're not growing. So we learn to sow. So here's what the Bible says. It says, when we bring the tithe, the tithe is a Hebrew term, master, it means first 10%. When we bring the tithe into the storehouse, into the church, there'll be a blessing poured out <laughs> on you that you won't even be able to contain, okay? That's, that's the promise of God. So how do, we, how do we get the promise of God? At TE Church, we don't think it's as much about the number. It's your best. For some of you, 10% is your best. We think it's a baseline in the New Testament. Pastor Lynn and I actually give more than 10%. Um, I think it's a starting point. And if you're not yet get it, giving, just start somewhere. But I think it's more about the position. It's about putting God First, mm -hmm. spiritually mature people put God first everywhere, including their finances. And here's how, let me, let me show you how this works. What a lot of people do is you get paid, and then what you do is you give the mortgage company their part, and then you give the car, you pay the car payment, and then you buy groceries, and then you give God his part. That's not God's part. You gave God's part to the mortgage company. And the mortgage company can't bless your finances. Only God can bless your finances. You've given it to the wrong person. So what do we do? We give God not only our best, Linda, we give God our first. And when we do that, look at 2 Corinthians 9.11. He will always make you rich enough to be generous at all times so that many will thank God for your gifts which they receive from others us. You just don't give to TE, you give through TE. Right. And we are blessing and helping people all over the planet mm -hmm. every single day because of your generosity and you growing up mature, being mature, understanding, watch this, when you release, now your hand is open to receive. Mm -hmm. And some of you have been doing this for so long, God can't put anything in it. Mm -hmm. So we give our best and we share our story. Next Sunday is going to be a banner day at TE Church. We're kicking off a brand new series, really my favorite. I know it's your favorite. Yeah. Many of our favorite series that we do all year, it's called Don't Stop the Music. And if you've never been here yet for a Don't Stop the Music series, I'm telling you, it is epic. We pick a classic rock song uh, the, the worship team does it next week. I'm telling you, there'll be pyro. I mean, it's going to be crazy town in here. Get ready. It's going to be wild. It's going to be incredible. So the worship team does it. I'm going to preach a biblical message on it, but it's our back to church bash. We are doing all kinds of stuff. We're giving away free food. We already got free ice cream. Did you get your ice cream today? Make sure you get the ice cream in the atrium. Free food, great music. It's just going to be a wild weekend. And here's our hope and our prayer. And here's where you come in and growing in your faith, sharing your story and inviting people. We're asking, who's your three? Every single person in this room, you know three people that need to be in the house of God next week. A friend, a family member, a coworker, somebody God has connected you to. And we are asking you, don't take no for an answer. Do whatever you have to do to get three people into the house of God. We're gonna set chairs up in the atrium next weekend. And if you have to sit out there so they can sit in here and hear about Jesus and have their life changed, we're gonna ask you to do that. If you have to come to all three services because one person can come to the 9.30, one person can come to 11.30, 
6.30 and somebody else can come to 6, say, man, I'm going to sacrifice so somebody else can meet and know the Lord Jesus Christ and have their life changed the way mine has been changed. So again, we are believing for over a 1,000 people in yeah. church next Sunday, Amen. and it happens when spiritually mature people bring people. We give our best. Amen. We share our story. It is going to be absolutely insane next Sunday. So I hope this has helped. What I'd like to do as we close this part of the service out, I just want to pray for all of you and encourage you today. Could, so could we just bow our heads and close our eyes? Those of you watching online, this goes for you as well. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we, we know you and we want to know you more. God, because as we begin to know you better, God, we begin to emulate who you are through our life. Jesus, we just want to be like you, God, and we don't want to stay babies. So God, help us grow up and do the things that you did. And God, I know sometimes it's a struggle, God, because it's hard to grow up. It's hard to be an adult. God, but this is who you've called us to be. So I'm praying for each person here. So in this moment, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you were here today and you're like, man, there are some areas in my life that I'd like to grow up in just a really personal moment, would you just lift a hand up in the air and say, man, I, God, grow me in, in an area. There's an area that I need to grow in today. Yeah, hands up all over the room. Thank you for your honesty. You're like, I just, I need to grow up. So Father, you see our hands, you know our hearts. God, help us take the step that we need to, to take so that we can be more like you, Jesus. Father, we love you. We do trust you. And because the tomb is empty, we believe that the best is yet to come. Come on, somebody, if you believe it.